Gotham Knights is one of the most technically broken games I've played this year, but strangely enough, it's also one of my favorites. I spent close to 60 hours in it, taking my time with everything it has to offer, and I would have not done even half of that if it weren't for a few key features I really enjoyed. From the captivating story, great combat mechanics, and a city that's surprisingly more alive than it seems, this is yet another great package being held back by performance issues, multiple crashes, and other bugs that unfortunately plagued my playthrough. Despite all of this though, I'll try to keep a balanced view, going over both the positives and the negatives before giving it a final verdict. Now, I'm going to begin with the performance and its issues because this was such a massive hindrance for my enjoyment. Once I got my hands on the game, it all became crystal clear why even the next-gen consoles don't support a stable 60fps option. That's because I don't think anything can at the current time, at least not unless you're willing to make some really big sacrifices and bring those settings way, way down, and I mean all the way to low. I've played this game on a brand new RTX 3090, some 64 gigs of DDR5 and whatever top of the line 1 billion core processor, it didn't matter, I wasn't able to touch max settings as the stutter and the hangups were simply unbearable in normal gameplay. Not so much in closed environments, but especially noticeable when out in the open world. I don't think there's any patch fix right now or at the very least at the time of making this video, but personally this game was worse in that regard in terms of optimization, even compared to Saints Row, which was quite broken at launch to say the least. And this is why this pisses me off to no end, because Warner Brothers let technical issues to stand in the way of another great game, an otherwise amazing plot and fun gameplay experience. The story captivates right from the start. It's so immediately engaging in fact that I do not even want to spoil it. I believe that this is the first time I will not show any intro cutscenes of a game because it's so worth seeing it on your own for the first time. And it just sets the tone perfectly for everything that follows next in the main story narrative and how the sidekicks now have to pick things up to see how deep the rabbit hole goes. It really has everything, intrigue, mystery, conspiracy, and lots of detective work to constantly collaborate with your teammates and find out the next big scary thing that's about to shake Gotham to its core. Which, to nobody's surprise, does happen, a lot, and oftentimes makes you question if there's any semblance of civilization left in this godforsaken city. My only problem with the main narrative is that there isn't more of it, though after about 15 hours it takes you to complete it, you're pretty much getting all the entertainment you need. Well that and the pretty outdated facial animations, maybe for 2015 that would have worked, but definitely not in this day and age. It feels gaming has made such tremendous leaps in rendering real human emotion that comparing that with Gotham Knights version would just make the game look bad. You know, it says something about the game when the main characters have clearly less budget poured into their faces than the guy that's supposed to be dead in his intro scene. I don't know if they blew their budget on rendering all of Bruce's pores, but it almost feels intentional to maybe even let the knights know that they are still sideliners in their own game compared to a character like Batman. Who knows, maybe that's also the reason why Red Hood is mad all the time. Luckily enough, the villain arcs pick things off and provide an additional pleasant surprise when it comes to quality and length. Usually side stories in video games are not on the same narrative quality as the main plot, but that is definitely not the case here. The main villain arcs for Harley, Clayface and Mr. Freeze are just as good if not maybe sometimes even better than the main plot in letting you dive into the mind of what makes these criminals iconic. Plus, they all end up in super awesome multi-phase boss fights and will definitely test your skills, but also provide a ton of really good loot, so there's that, you do get a ton to extract from the side content in Gotham Knights, and it does help you extend the gameplay duration when it comes to like just paying attention to the main story. I just wish that there was more for it because I really got engaged with it throughout its entire duration. Now, Gotham itself is the other big star of the show. While technically not with the same visually distinct skyline of the Arkham games, it's still a gorgeous setting mixing the vibrant neon lights of the richer financial district and the city center with the almost claustrophobic back alleys of the south side cauldron and the upper north side. Gotham is filled with roughly 40 landmarks that all feel as unique 
as they are imposing. What caught me off guard is how much more lively the street levels were compared to the gameplay previews we had before. Like cars and pedestrians roam the street levels and will oftentimes even react to your current hero, either with a positive or a negative comment. But I guess they did not really want to show the fact that you can do things on the street level that wouldn't necessarily make Batman proud. So before you ask, yes, it's possible to attack, even beat up civilians, and even all the way up to running them over with your bat cycle. You can also get in trouble with the cops, and no, there's no police system, but let's just say that the GCPD isn't particularly fond of masked vigilantes, so they will attack you on site if you don't make your exit quickly. The dynamic goes deeper with various crime syndicates and dozens of illegal activities that slowly but surely engulf Gotham, with some of them evolving as you progress through the main narrative. Like one thing I really liked is how certain gangs can benefit from the tech that they stole or got from certain villains, which in turn now lets them spawn in the open world events and thus becoming much more dangerous. This brings us to the combat. Now, it starts fairly simplistic and similar to Arkham, but as you progress through the game, you'll notice the focus becomes increasingly higher on special abilities, gear, and even more so mods. Around the middle of the game, so around 13 to 15, is when you'll start getting a lot of elemental effect weapons and mods that can turn you into a true killing machine in a non-lethal way, because the game makes a point out of that. But it ends up letting you deal with large groups of enemies in ways you couldn't before. I also appreciated how it rewards skillful play. If you perfect your dodges, counterattacks, and especially so if you don't rush in and button mash your way out of every fight, which I bet a lot of reviewers out there will miss, you'll be rewarded heavily. What's not so great about combat, on the other hand, is the god-awful AI, at least when it comes to stealth. Don't get me wrong, you can still go entire levels fully stealthy, and in my beginner's guide I've explained why that can be an amazing advantage early on, but the contextual detection in this game is comically basic and downright lazy at times. Like, if you distract someone with a sound, multiple enemies that happen to be around will just flock like a bunch of geese into the same direction with seemingly no communication between them. Also, oftentimes you can literally be in the middle of a stealth takedown with some other guy sitting a few feet away and literally looking at you while not being able to recognize what's happening. This almost makes stealth gameplay sometimes too easy but also sometimes even way too hard because enemies react so basically they might ruin a perfectly executed plan on going in completely silent. Now, the Bat Family is one of the other aspects I wanted to touch on quickly. Going in the game for the first time, I was worried that they would feel too similar, with Warner Brothers not having spent enough time fleshing each one out. Well, I'm glad that was not the case, and especially as you progress on, they become increasingly more unique. Each knight feels distinctively unique in their own way, extremely powerful as well once you get the hang of them. Early on, the combat flow might look similar since you don't really have any skills yet, so you kind of rely on melee damage, but once you get special abilities and the mods I was talking about, and even more so once you invest points into the skill trees, their playstyles diverge massively. Like, you could go for a super acrobatic Nightwing and, like, use his backflips to take down enemies in cool ways, or the more slow but utterly brutal Red Hood skills that can destroy entire groups of enemies. Even Robin is super tough with his fast attacks and strong deception skills, while Barbara is a non-stopping punching machine. It oftentimes feels like it's hard to decide which character to focus on because they all bring something amazing to the table. The difference is also noticeable in the smallest of their animations, the way they move and the way they react. Even a simple action such as using the grappling hook has completely different flavor animations for each of the characters to make them stand out. On the contrary, their iconic traversals don't all have the same levels of fun and enjoyment. Robin's teleportation in particular is the most dull out of the bunch, as you just spend most of your time dragging your camera over a distance before you can use it again. Bad Girl's Bat Dive is probably my most favorite and the most cinematic, but don't expect the same level of animations, quality, and like just the movement from the Arkham games. Red Hood was surprisingly more fun than the previews made it seem, as the Lazarus Jump is a lot cooler in practice. Meanwhile, Nightwing's flying jet is, well, okay, it's way better than any other traversal in terms of like just going anywhere you want, even way high up into the sky, but 
I played it so much that it kind of became a chore for me at some point. Touching on the progression really quickly, this is also another solid feature of Gotham Knights and I was pleasantly surprised that as I was leveling up and gaining new loot, I was like just getting a lot better at dealing with all of the challenges, doing more damage but also doing it in new cool ways that I couldn't before. I'm gonna touch on this subject in some of the other videos that are coming in the following hours and days, but what did not make sense to me was the UI, especially if you use a controller or if you're playing this on a console. This has to be by far the worst UI I've seen in any video game thus far, almost on par with some bad mobile ports out there. My one major gripe is how convoluted it feels and looks every time you waste time navigating the wrong submenus unless you have a literal mouse and keyboard. Now in terms of co-op, I can't really say much as I haven't scratched the surface of that, even though me and my partner are in the same house and with the same internet connection didn't run into any issues so far, but um, co-op really wasn't that important for me to like hinder progress in any way or make challenges too difficult if I wasn't doing co-op in particular. Now, final verdict, should you buy the game or should you wait out? Well, here's a few things you have to keep in mind. The game is great, but the performance is not. You're gonna run into issues. And God of War Ragnarok is also two weeks away. So do you have the money to throw away for a video game? Then the answer is yes. Go ahead and pre-order it. It's pretty okay. For everybody else, maybe wait for a sale. I think it's worth it to play. But at a $70 markup, I'm not really sure, especially for the consoles. But PC is not better either with the bad performance issues. This is it. Thanks so much for watching. And until next time.